So rescaling Beethoven, very long, very short. The innovation of sound recording and reproduction technology some 145 years ago spurred composers to imagine and indeed create works of extreme duration, very long, lasting days, years, or more, and conversely, very short, miniatures of a few seconds, but nonetheless encapsulate large expressions or denote the corpus of pre-existing music. Comparing Leif Inge's nine-beat stretch from 2002 and a section from Johannes Kreidler's compression sound art from 2009, this paper reflects upon idea-based idea sonic art that explores duration. Listening to such works will test Karl-Heinz Stockhausen's notion of unified time structure, as well as Pierre Schaeffer's definition of a musical object as necessarily having an overall temporal form that allows optimal memorization, especially, he claimed, it could neither be too short nor too long. In this perspective, we ask, what makes us understand a work of music as a unitary whole? So Armore Schaefer, he advanced that the soundscape of the world is a macrocosmic musical composition. Ever since there was a listener, Recall that soundscape consists of events heard. The world soundscape has been playing here, there, everywhere. If the world can be listened to as music, it is the longest piece that could ever exist. It is continuous, changing, and it's currently being performed. Karl-Heinz Stockhausen, he advanced, uh, he introduced a, uh, and I quote, a basic concept of a single unified musical time. Conceptual categories, he said, such as Color, harmony and rhythm, dynamics and form must be regarded as corresponding to the different components of this unified time. We have a little performance by Karl Stockhausen. A instrument here. Uh, 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 and in between there is a region where we don't know what it really is, if we still can count the attacks or not. So there we are. Uh, another seven octaves, as you know from the keyboard of the piano. It has seven to eight octaves, seven and a half exactly. And then what is beyond that is just brilliance, color, coloring frequencies. Another 3,000 cycles is the highest about cycles per second of the piano, then 6,000, 12,000, and then it's almost finished with older people. And uh, now it's finished, really. We're at 10,000, 12,000. Well, you all get old, don't, don't <laughs> worry about this. And the music sounds, all music sounds very sweet because the brilliant high sound is no longer perceived too much. Um, to <laughs> um, yeah, like most people who listen to the radio, they shut, the, shut off the high frequencies. Um, and the music sounds very nice. There we are. The ranges of perception are ranges of time. Time of perception. And the time is subdivided by us, by the construction of our body and our instruments to perceive. This is what Stockhausen does to illustrate that there is this sort of middle ground between impulses and pitch. And then he goes on to say that uh, we, we have more and more cycles, we have the highest notes that we can uh, maybe sing is maybe 2000 hertz, we can double this an octave up or two times two octaves, and we come into a region where, where it's all, all, all about timbre and brilliance of sound declining as we grow older, Stockhausen says. Okay, Stockhausen does this much better than I, but at least uh, I got the message through there, I hope. Um, Erik Christensen, Danish uh, uh, researcher in music perception, he, he painted this uh, uh, picture of um, um, the five dimensions of uh, listening, as he calls it. So starting with the close linkage between intensity and space, that is essentially what acoustics are. You know, sound in, uh, physical sound is um, uh, variations of intensity in, in, uh, in, uh, in the room. And, and then that can create a timbre, which creates pulses and eventually musical movement. 
Uh, and uh, the linear perspective is given by Curtis Rhodes. Uh, so in this diagram, you have very long durations on the left and very, very short ones on the right. But the interesting thing is that he links this to how do we actually perceive them musically and then so sense how, what, how can we use them as, um, as um, musicians as well. So there's a middle ground here, Rhodes says, of um, common durations of musical compositions, two to 15 minutes. Today, we're interested in very long ones, stretching, so to say, into years, and the very short ones, which go into, well, less than a second at least. Uh, but as you can see here, it's quite clear that we do have lots and lots of um, time uh, to the right, in particular. Uh, but this is in the domain of timbre and uh, in um, uh, what Stock has referred to as brilliance. Yeah? OK. So and one little reflection here about, uh, so we have long and short, but we also have big and small. We have right and left. We have thick and thin in terms of tone or rhythms can be fast or slow. And uh, we can think of them as musical objects, dimensions and directions, the musical textures or spatial positioning in relation to the um, uh, spatial uh, music uh, uh, response codes uh, and uh, and physical moment uh, movement, uh, which is um, really what um, uh, really what Chappelle would, would refer to as uh, gait or allure. So loudness, space, timbre, and envelope—they are all dimensions. But I think that uh, duration can also be understood as a dimension, and that's the point I want to make. Okay, so here's some examples of uh, long pieces of music. And uh, now I don't know if I'm going to dare to um, uh, call up on YouTube, but I will try to do so for John Cage's uh, organ piece, ASLSP, as slowly as possible. He um, composed 65 actions, as he called it. Uh, and uh, in the uh, interpretation that is currently being uh, executed in the church of, of uh, Halberstadt in Germany, this interpretation of this piece will take 639 years. So they have uh, reached, uh, in fact, the, uh, they have just reached the 12th sound change, but we will listen to the 11th sound change, which was, well, 11 years ago. And I think it is a quite nice, nicely captured moment. And it shows that such a change can indeed be, can indeed be an event, you know? So as soon as we're past this little commercial. Okay. We're just before the moment of that new event. Okay, there you go. So people have been waiting for this for years and years, and I think that the uh, the next, the eleventh uh, sound change is going to happen in twenty twenty six. So this is indeed a very long piece. Um, digital means allow for making um, this um, well by recombination of materials, such as in Jim Finer's long player, um, which is made to be exactly one thousand years, or as in um, uh, the Freakout Collective, of, of which I am a part, so I've been um, part of doing these kind of installations, which are in some sense infinite, because the material is being recombined, remixed digitally. Um, and, and this particular one, which is in Uppsala, it has been um, um, playing since 2014, and it will continue to do so as long as uh, the house is standing and the uh, loudspeakers are working. When Beethoven composed his Ninth Symphony in 1824, it was indeed a very long piece, maybe one of the longest uh, around, and more than one hour in a performance. We're going to listen to a bit of uh, Leif Inge's um, continuation or derivative work, Nine Beat Stretch. And I think here I'm going to play uh, a little piece so you get it in your ears. Where do I have it? Right here. Um, <clears throat> of a very stretched music. So this is the, more or less the start, beginning of the piece, and you might remember, recall how Beethoven's piece starts with the exposition of these big chords, the 
D and A and we don't know if it's major or minor. Here we go. Gently. Okay, so that's a very short excerpt of uh, Leif Inge's piece. Um, and I, I curated the Asian premiere as a concert installation version in Seoul uh, uh, four years ago of this piece. Um, we come to very short, we cannot, we must mention Anton Weben, of course, who, who, who in some sense um, compressed or, or, or um, the, the uh, romantic gestures or classical gestures into very dense expressions, short pieces. But this I'm sure that most of you know very well. But something that you may not know as well is the, the arguably the shortest um, uh, piece uh, released as a single by the uh, noise core group uh, Napalm Death in 1987. So this is a piece that is 1.3 seconds long and we shall listen to it. Um, I think we shall listen to it in when they perform it in, in a live version because it's, I think that, that brings the point over. So that is a very compressed expression. They have also made um, um, a music video of this, and um, you can take a look at that one as well. It goes with the style. And there you go. Short, but not sweet. And then we come to um, the, um, uh, the second pillar in my investigation here. So it's Johannes Keidler's compression sound art pieces in particular his uh, complete Beethoven symphonies played in one second. So it's part of a playlist, uh, as you see, it's the first one there. Uh, and, and, and I can really recommend listening to these. They are, they are ingenious, they're sort of spot on uh, interpretations of sonic events. Okay, I won't say any more, you will discover this. We will focus on the Beethoven symphonies. And here you will hear the ninth symphony in a very, very short interpretation. It is right at the end of the one second here. We can listen to all nine symphonies. There you go. That is very short. <clears throat> so this brings me to, um, to these um, uh, five perceptual constructs that I, I mentioned in my abstract, and if you have read that. Um, so I want to um, uh, present uh, five constructs that, through which we can discuss uh, how duration affects the ontology, uh, the understanding of musical works. So through duration. Um, and in a way, it, it offers a way to connect between the very long and the very short. The first one is continuity. Any process that is long enough tends to be perceptually broken down into segments. While the sense of hearing is active 24 seven, uh, and it commences in the unborn fetus, there are psychological constraints to our listening attention. Sooner or later, our mind wanders and there is a biological limit to staying awake. We can hear when we are asleep, but we cannot listen. In the context of commercial environments, the service scape, uh, is a semi-design often using Muzak that is both an agent and an outcome of the expanding, the non-stop life world of late capitalism, as Crowley writes. And the perspectives of ubiquity and metabol give rise to the question of how sound events emerge in the mind and how the perception of single events relate to the perception of the soundscape as a whole. Slowness. Not all works of long duration of listening or viewing 
contains slow music, but most do. And Inge's nine beat stretch, as I've seen, has a duration of exactly 24 hours. Um, and the, the stretched out interpretation maintains all the pitches of the original, uh, thanks to uh, techniques of granular synthesis with a grain size and the density carefully adjusted to the character of the music in different parts of the source recording. So the, technically, this was made by Anders Wienjai. Uh, continuous and minimally transformed interpolations of the original audio material effectively creates novelty, a slow, stretched out and original work of music. Repetition. With the conceptual composition Vexation, Eric Satie created an extremely long piece by having the pianist repeat a simple four-line segment hundreds of times. Working with turntables and records, Pierre Schaeffer exploited the infinite repeatability of the fragment, forcing himself to distinguish the sound as an object of perception, separated from its physical material cause. Through repetition, there is no longer event, but sequence, and possibly music. Linking repetition with sonic continuity, it seems that truly long piece of music must be continuous in the sense that there cannot be segments of non-activity. Recognizability. Musical miniatures were popular among classical composers. Beethoven's Bagatelle were perhaps exceptional in that they didn't rely so much on inherited schemes of ditties and popular dances, but rather became informal experimentations of musical form. Heidler, as we've seen, he proposed uh, what he calls a near vertical music, including an interpretation of Beethoven. Um, so Kreidler, he explores the borderline between recognizability and machine art. Specificity. It is possible to increase the lossy compression of data so that eventually, when it is extreme, the perceptual linkage between input and output is severed. Uh, in the case of very short pieces, uh, Kreidler's compression art balances at the edge of recognizability in order to remain specifically connected with the original. But the problem of specificity reappears also at the other end of extreme durations. As the musical structures of a piece of music are drawn out in time, their specificity decreases until the relevant connotation disappears entirely. At the extreme, there is only the ubiquitous metabolic drone. Luckily, through this process of lengthening, other qualities are gained, or rather they are gradually revealed. Reading writes, as the tempo of the music slows down, the previously inaudible dissonances automatically move to the center of our attention. The liminal deceleration of the music cannot help but bring the details into focus. So this analysis is apt for nine beat stretch or similar meta compositions, but when applied to Schaefer's um, universal soundscape composition it cannot be time stretched it cannot be made to represent anything but itself so after having considered very briefly the these five essential aspects of long and short music i will make three claims firstly that inge's nine beat stretch is not a piece of 24 7 music as has been claimed by Dietrich. secondly that kreidler's Compression sound art, specifically these Beethoven symphonies in one second, deals not with compression, but with lossy compression, an important distinction. Thirdly, a listening-based understanding of these works depends crucially on the cultural status of the source material. And that brings me to what links them together, and that is iconicity. The slow music of 9B stretch manages to establish itself as a piece with a specific identity, exactly because it relies on a well-established cultural icon. The listener is drawn into the materiality of the orchestra and the voices, uh, an imagined reality of the trace of something that did exist. If it is true that, as Chris Cutler writes, plundered sound carries, above all, the unique ability not just to refer, but to be. It offers not just the new means, but a new meaning. End quote. And this implies that when we listen to nine beat stretch, we listen to, in fact, three things at once. Firstly, Beethoven as a cultural artifact in the semantic listening mode. Secondly, the sounds themselves in the reduced listening mode. And thirdly, audio stretching as a technique in and of itself in the causal listening mode. By definition, derivative works only exist at the ex as extensions of previously created works, 
and the force of artistic novel novelty, if any, depends on their ability to retain a cultural connection with the original. This connection is evident in Kreidel's collection of compressed cultural icons. While these are bursts of musical humor, uh, Leifinger's piece draws the audience into an embodied mode of listening, offering an approach to the transcendental. To sum up, for very long musical pieces, I posit that the defining concepts are continuity, slowness, and repetition, while for very short, they are recognizability and specificity. And of course, these five, they apply across the board. In conclusion, the principle that, um, <clears throat> that connects, that allows the serendipitous connection between these uh, two works is the overarching concept of iconicity, an extrinsic quality enabled by technologies of appropriation. So this is the, uh, um, uh, the end of my, my sort of theoretical uh, presentation here. And I think I have a couple of more minutes, um, if I may. And I will very briefly show how I have gone about to, to, um, to explore this artistically. And this is very speculative. It's a sort of tinkering in my, uh, in my little studio. But the basic idea is to connect the long and the short. And how can we do that? Well, we have on a line here, we have Inge, Beethoven, and Kreidler, right? Uh, these are the duration of their works. Uh, we can count the number of seconds this way. Uh, and then we find the linear proportions. So it's 22 times. Uh, between Beethoven and Inge, and it's something like 30,000 times between Beethoven and Kreidler. Um, it makes more sense, however, to, uh, uh, to think of this in terms of uh, octaves, as Stockhausen certainly would, would tell us if, in, in, that, in that lecture that he gave. So between um, Inge and Beethoven, there's something like four and a half octaves of time. Uh, and between Beethoven and Kreidler, there's another 15 octaves. Of time, so uh, you, you know we can take Inge's recording of 24 hours and compress it so that it has the duration of um, uh, a, a, a normal regular performance of Beethoven's piece, and likewise we can take Kreidler's 0.13 seconds and stretch it out so that it has a duration of uh, more than one hour. So I did this, uh, and we can hear it, but it's no not really satisfying. So I took this one step further because I wanted to mix them together and, and uh, allow us to, to we can listen in layers, right? So uh, I realized that the, between Inge and Kreidler, there's something like 20 octaves, or actually very close to 666,666 666 times linearly. Uh, I, I do not know why this number comes up. But there is a midpoint, which is something like 10 octaves of time on either side, and we can use this to create a, a, a time compression of Inge's piece of 816 times, and a time stretching of Kreidler's little fragment of 816 times, and then they have exactly the same duration. Uh, I also added um, uh, yet another way of thinking about compression, and that is uh, taking a MIDI file uh, of Beethoven's uh, Ninth Symphony, and um, um, reading it as if it were audio data, so we, we can listen to we can listen to the MIDI, but not as symbolic information, but just as in some sense pure uh, pure samples. And mixed together, these uh, three things they become a little speculative piece that I called MIDI Fan B21, and I would like to conclude by playing to you. It's one minute and 40 seconds. And here it is. And this is perhaps also then a conceptual, conceptual sound, sound or idea-based sound art. Okay. Mini Pan Beethoven. <laughs>
Okay, well, thank you very much.